chapter 3, Nehemiah chapter 3, we're going to have the business meeting after I've talked for about 30 minutes. So somebody clock me back there, it's about 10 after, so stop me at about, that, when it gets on the 8 back there, would you please? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 3 tonight, we, we begin chapter 3, actually I think before we took off to Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, when you look at the, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a book that emphasizes building in battle. We've already discussed that. Uh, there are three returns to Jerusalem by three individuals. We've already talked about that, Zerubbabel. Uh, then uh, it also another return under Ezra. Ezra was to rebuild uh, the temple. And uh, now uh, Nehemiah is returning to rebuild the wall. Now the emphasis on the book are the walls. Yet when you come to chapter 3, it's like God says, wait a minute. We're going to talk a little bit about the walls being repaired. And that is central. However, we got to mention the gates. We, there's something in this chapter, and it's here for a reason, why God specified telling us about the rebuilding of the gate. He could have just said, and all the gates were repaired. Yeah. Couldn't he? But he designates so many little sweet little nuggets in the Word of God in this one chapter that sometimes, and I know, I've studied this book several times. I only preached through it one other time. And uh, I've learned, even as I've reviewed and went back again, some things I never saw on the first journey, the first study. And I've read through it, I don't know how many times. But uh, we, we learned in the first lesson that the first gate that he deals with is in verse 1 and verse 2. Somebody tell me what the first gate was. Gate. By the way, so many of you are new tonight. You know what? I may not have brought those. I don't think. Let me see if I brought those. I gave, I gave y'all pictures of the... The gates? Yeah, I do. Right here. Good, good, good. I did bring them. Super. Anybody still got your gates? Did you get one before? You didn't get one before. I'm not giving them out twice. Because I'm going to give it to you one, twice. That's because of your stupidity. All right? No, I'm just kidding. But anyway. All right. One second. Uh, I'll tell you what. One per family. Can we do that? Uh, anybody else back in the back doesn't have them? I know some of you. Uh, probably surely doesn't have it. It shows you exactly the location of all these gates, and they're there even for specific, as we learned in the first gate we looked at, all right? But uh, if you have it, pull it out, because we're going to re uh, review, we're going to look back at the sheep gate. The first gate that he touches on is the, the sheep gate. That was the gate in which uh, verse, one, verse 1 and verse 2. Interesting enough, we brought out to attention that the priest was the one and that uh, family and that clan was the ones God dedicated and assigned through Nehemiah to do the rebuilding. Why of this gate? Because a sheep has to do with a shepherd. I mean, it has to do with a priest, doesn't it? A priest takes the, the sacrifices and that's where all the sacrifices came in. So if you wanted to write over or make some notes on the sheet I gave you tonight, you say the first gate is the northernmost one at the top, I think at the top of your page. I think that's, that would be turned if it's the most northern part of the city. And it's the sheep gate. You could simply put one sheep gate equals salvation. Now, why did God, do you think, start off the mentioning of the gates, the very first one? He could have started with the fish gate. He could have started with the golden gate. He could have started with the eastern gate. Hey, hey, he could have done any of the gates first, but he chose the first gate to mention being the sheep gate. And the number one reason, I believe, is because it does represent salvation. You see, God begins where we have to begin. And for us to have a beginning with God, we've got to go through the sheep gate. We've got to experience what the sheep gate represents. All the lambs came through the sheep gate. Many believe the Lord Jesus Christ, most of the times He entered Jerusalem, He entered through the sheep gate, except for the triumphal entry that He made, and then He entered, many believe, through the eastern gate. All right? But here's the thing. When you go through the sheep gate, it is right behind this gate where Pilate scrutinized Jesus Christ. It is, we know it was outside the, the inside the sheep gate that Pilate's home and place where we were told that Jesus was brought to Pilate's dwelling. And there he scrutinized him. And of course we know the verdict was what I find no what? No fault, fault in him. He was a sinless, unblemished, unspotted lamb of God. He is everything John the Baptist called him and said he was in John chapter 1 verse 29 when he cried out, when he saw him in the crowd. And something inside John knew this was the Son of God, this was the Lamb of God. And he pointed a finger, I believe, in the crowd. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. 
This Jesus went through this gate very, very frequently, very, very often. With every entrance of this gate, God was crying out, there's my lamb. That's the final sacrifice. Once he makes his way into that city and he's, he's going to come back out to be crucified on the cross, all the sacrifices, all the oxen, all the lambs, all the sheep, all the animal sacrifices and blood sacrifices will be null and void because, thank God, His blood took care of it all. Amen? Read the book of Hebrews. That has everything to do with the old sacrifice of the Old Testament and how the Old Testament is not near as good because the New Testament is better because Jesus is better. He's better than angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the sacrifices. Amen? For His blood, thank God, can cleanse us from all sin. So God begins with the sheep gate, and rightly so. And then before he even finishes describing and going into the next gate, he, he says in verse 2, and even those of the city of Jer Jericho, verse 2, literally helped in building the sheep, or repairing the sheep gate. Why would he mention Jericho? I think God's got it there for a reason. He didn't have to mention where they're from. Isn't that right? But he wanted to hey, even those from Jericho, when you go all the way back to the, 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 your Bible in the, uh, the book of uh, Joshua, Joshua chapter, um, good night, I'm trying to think, where, what, what, uh, what book, oh man, oh, what's, this, what's the verse? I can't remember, oh, I hate that. Um, Joshua, mm, man, when I get on something, I gotta get it, all right? Uh, Joshua 6, verse 26. You'll find out God pronounced on the city of Jericho, you are an accursed city. Now, why are the men of Jericho participating in the rebuilding of this particular wall? I think God's saying something to us. I think God is reminding every one of us we're under a curse. Yeah. We're cursed because of our personal sin. We're cursed because of Adam's sin and Eve's sin. But I'll tell you what. We're just in a cursed world, amen? Now, have you ever done, and I know you have, like I have, I come away every time whenever I drive down the highway going toward my home, when I'm passing Little Debbie, you know what I'm talking about, the highway? Man, when you look back toward the Blue Ridge Mountains behind my home, man, what a grandeur, beautiful, beautiful scenery, amen? amen? Man, I don't care what scenery, and they almost constantly change because the sun, the clouds, the weather, the seasons, just a, a ray of beauty. Imagine. I don't care what is the pretty, prettiest place I've ever been was Montana. There is no place I've ever darkened anywhere. I've been to Israel, been to some other places. But can I tell you what? I believe Montana's got to be the prettiest state in the union. I, I just don't, I just can't believe. You've been to Montana. you never been to Montana. Oh, you poor soul. But anyway, but anyway, but anyway, man, you have. I'm telling you, there is, it's just has unique beauty. Yes, it's Rockies. Yes, they don't have the same trees we have. But man, it's just everywhere. And when you look out, all you can see is mountains. And they're not, these are molehills compared to their mountains. I mean, oh, yeah. some of their mountains, three times the height of most of these mountains we're seeing anywhere in the Shenandoah Valley. Some even four times higher. And they stay snow capped even as up. They had snow a couple weeks ago. Man, I wouldn't say I want that, but I like what it does to the mountains because it makes it uniquely look different. But can you imagine, as beautiful as all the scenery we've ever seen put together, it's still under curse. Think about it. And yet, through our eyes, it's beautiful, isn't it? So, having said that, can you imagine, church, what in the world heaven must look like? Mm -hmm. When Paul literally writes and says, Hey, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither could even enter into the heart of men those things God is preparing for those that know Him. Man, what a statement. Man, there is no way to describe heaven. And this junk you see on TV occasionally, these stars that say they died and they saw a bright light and they started ushering over and they come back, is a bunch of bull. All right? Crazy. Uh, I believe the minute a child of God dies, they step right all the way over. Amen? Mm -hmm. Come on now. To be absent from the body is to be what? Immediately present with the Lord. And last time I checked, my Lord's in heaven, so if you're going to be with the Lord, you've got to be in heaven instantly. All right? And so thank God for that. So the sheep gate speaks of, of salvation is the very, very first gate prepared. And then the very next gate, go to your left. God didn't choose to go to the right. And by the way, uh, the sheep gate is your most northern gate. Now, we, we, I don't have time to go in. We told you about the, the, the blank space out in space. 
Uh, good, and I don't have all the facts before me tonight that I shared with you the other week. The scientists already came up back in, I think it was the year 207. Uh, they discovered it. Even before 207, they knew it was there. They just didn't have the means and the technology to discover how vast it is. But it's written in the book of Job. And uh, we talked to you about how. Where is heaven at? Well, it could be in that hole somewhere. Because, man, it says it's over 22,000 light years away. Or wide. No, wide. Can you imagine? And anybody here know how quickly light travels? Somebody gave me that last week. 100 what? 186,000 miles a second. 186,000 miles per second. That's pretty fast. I can't run that fast. And yet I think I gave you a statistic that it would take something like 22,000 years, something like that, to travel just the, the across this space that's out in space that... Uh, the astronomers never saw before until a few years ago. Can I tell you what? You can always bank this to be true. The Bible will always prove science. Yeah. Notice, I didn't say that science will prove the Bible. I said the Bible will always prove science because the Bible was here before scientists ever discovered anything. Amen? Amen? So, hey, I believe that heaven is out there and it is the most northernest place. The spear and the, the opening... And uh, the book of Job tells us that God has put something out in the north. I believe heaven's in the north. Now, I hate to say that, being a southerner. Amen? No offense to those of you watching those from the north, or those of you attending from the north. How many are from the north in this service tonight? One, one, two, three. Three that claims, but they're glad they changed. Amen? Amen. But, uh, but the truth of the matter is, if it's in the north, Hey, this makes some good preaching, whether or not I can prove it or not. Why would the sheep gate be the most northernest, northernest gate? I think God's saying, hey, the only one, one way to get to the, to the north, the only way to get to the new Jerusalem, the only way to make it to the new heaven, you got to go through the sheep gate first. Amen? So anyway, notice the next gate. Go to your left. And the very next gate is called, and it's found in beginning in verse 3, the Bible says they begin to repair or rebuild the fish gate. And the fish gate did the sons of Hashiana build, who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof. Now, when you read all the other gates down to a certain point, you will discover that as they built the walls, as they placed the gates in there, the gates are named, it will always say, and they put locks on the gate. This one has a lock. All the others in the next several verses that we're going to go over will have locks. There's only a few that's not locked. All right? Now, let me tell you, the very first one, don't have no lock on it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sheep gate. Salvation. Thank God. Hey, one day, it will be locked yep. by God himself. But right now, thank God, there's no lock on salvation. Man, all whosoever will can still come in. Whosoever will can still be saved. Whosoever will repent still can find Christ as Savior. Amen? It's not salvation in the church through baptism, through ritual, through uh, some catechism, through some education, through reformation. It has solely always been through the Lord Jesus Christ, Him only. Amen? Amen. He is the only gate, the only way, the only door. But right beside this sheep gate, He places the fish gate. Right beside, on your notes, the fish gate equals soul winning. i got to do it all in S's or as much as I can, all right? Uh, it's going to be representing soul winning or witnessing. When God places the gates, and I think he did it strategically as far as the word of God's concerned, he starts out with the sheep gate, which equals what? Salvation. What I just teach you. Salvation. Represents salvation. All the sacrifice, the substitutionary lambs were brought through there. And Jesus Christ came through it many, 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 many times. So, if that salvation and the very next gate is the fish gate, represents witnessing, soul winning, then what has God got a message for us to? I think it's the first thing after salvation. We ought to have a first inkling and a desire to see somebody else come to Jesus like we did. I remember a man right after I got saved. At, uh, at Babcock and Wilcott made it public for no, no, known uh, at Elon Baptist Church. Joe Knowles was the pastor at that particular time. Carol came about a year later. And uh, I got baptized again. And, uh, man, it was just a change. But can I tell you, it wasn't long, no sooner than I got saved, that, man, I wanted some of those people at work at Babcock and Wilcott that I'd, I'd made, made acquaintances with. George Lovell was a drinking guy okay. and a party animal, too. And a couple of other guys in my machine shop that I'd gotten connected with. And we went out together and done some things together, which 
were not necessarily good, but I wanted those persons, those people, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God planted in my soul a desire to see people saved. I mean, man, sometimes I wish he had minimized it some a little bit. But, man, I have a passion to see people saved. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I, I, guess, I guess that's why I knew that I knew that I knew God wanted me into prison evangelism. Because, man, God just started blessing it so. Man, if I could take any one of you, or all of you, to one, if I could have taken you to the service Sunday night, it would have blew your socks off. Mm -hmm. You'd have been dancing barefooted on holy ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, God, the Holy Ghost moved in that service. Mm -hmm. My wife wrote a little article about it on Facebook, but I'm telling you, 25 men came forward to trust Christ. Mm -hmm. I had men literally with tattoos from the neck down. I mean, covered in tattoos. I mean some big boys. I'm not talking about no little boys. No, but one just big dude crying, falling, came and hugged me at the end. He said, Pastor, thank you so much for coming and telling me about Jesus. I'm not going to hug you. <laughs> Your wife Debbie hardly wants to see Charles. But anyway, I did sure don't. I'm just simply saying, man, there, man, there's a compulsion inside me to see people come to Jesus. Man, I want to see people say, how about you? Man, when you look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said this, not the disciples, not I. Jesus said it. Uh, follow me and I will make you what? Fishes of men. I like what one old-time preacher said long ago. He said, the reason there's not much fishing today is because there's not a whole lot of following. How close are we really to him? I'm telling you, the best little witness I'm out with, she puts me to shame at every restaurant we go into. Even just this last week, Ann and I, I, we were together. Ann came over and Harold sung two nights in the three-night meeting in the prison. And uh, I'm telling you what, to be frank and honest, she shames me. I mean, she goes around like a beeline. I mean, just anybody. She don't care. I guess she's so short, she knows, number one, two things. No man's going to hit it because she's real small. And she is a woman. And she's cute even when she's up here preaching to me. Are you with me? But you let me try that, I'm going to get a black eye or something. I'll tell you right now, when she goes like a beeline for these people. And uh, it's just crazy. I mean, she would witness to a wooden ending if she thought he'd give his heart to Christ. <laughs> And she puts me to shame. I'm telling you, man, don't you want a burden to see somebody come to Christ? Let me ask you this question. Who's going to be in heaven because you are? Who's going to be there because of you personally? By the way, yes, a life can give somebody a desire to come to know him or at least get you thinking that way. Herbert Langford got me wanting it because I watched his life consistently every day. Always up. Always smiling, always in the word whenever he had a break, always saying a blessing for his food. I mean, he did it unashamedly in front of all the other 90 men. I mean, even the men there called him, hey, watch that guy, he's weird. Mm -hmm. I'm serious, this is when I first came on in the machine shop. They said, man, uh, his name's Herbert Langford, man, he's a deacon. We call him Deke. And they were making fun of him. And he was a deacon for Thomas Road Baptist Church. But you know what? Herbert Langford, yes, through his life, caused me to see something's real. I saw it in my mom. I saw it in my dad. I saw it in my home. But it took more than that outside the home for me to see it. Because I saw too much hypocrisy at Elam Baptist Church. No offense to people that might tune in from Elam Baptist Church. But in the old days, we had a Sunday school teacher that drank worse than I did. I saw him get his fifth of liquor every Friday night. I went to Sunday school on a Sunday. Tom would come out of the liquor store with his fifth to head home. He also worked at Babcock and Wilcox. I know of some other things people were involved in in that church. And I knew the hypocrisy that was in so many of their lives. I'm not suggesting all of them are saved. Nor am I suggesting all of them are lost. But I'm simply saying, I needed to see somebody genuine and somebody 100% real. The real McCoy. I wanted to see the beef, as the old expression used to say. Amen? And the beef is, live for Jesus if you're really saved by Jesus. Amen? <laughs> Jesus will always bring about... A difference in someone's heart and someone's life. Mm -hmm. Always. Man, I, that's why I have a problem with people that, that tell me they're doing to sin still, certain particular sins especially, and they've been saved for several years. Mm -hmm. Because that's not the same Holy Ghost that came in me. Mm 
That's not the same Holy Ghost that pricked me. That's not the same Holy Ghost that convicted me of my drinking, my carousing, and a lot of other bad things I was involved with before coming to Jesus Christ. But man, when he came in, the Holy Ghost came in, I got news for you. Man, he started cleaning up the platter, the plate, the saucer, and man, by the time he finished with me, and it took some years, thank God, but it didn't take years for me to quit the drinking and so forth, but it wasn't me to quit. He removed it from me. He removed the desire for that garbage. Amen. So, the fish gate. Man, we ought to first want to have a desire to, to be the reason why God has somebody else in heaven because we reach them with the gospel. It was our track that maybe led them to Christ. It was our witnessing or our question, if you died today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And that got the gears ticking and thinking and turning. And uh, God's Holy Spirit started using what we get. Hey, all of us, with, hey, some of us so see. Others, others of us sometimes... Throw water on it. Amen? Because, man, no seed's going to grow. No seed's going to germinate. No seed's going to come forth with new life until it's first seeded. Then it must be fertilized. And then it must be rained on. Amen? It's got to experience water. So some of us are going to sow. Some of us are going to water. But never forget, it is God and God always alone that gives the final increase. Amen. God and God alone. Always. Amen? Amen. So, hey, the, the, sh the sheep gate. And then there's the, the fish gate right there. Hey, the first thing we want to do, we want to be a little bit like Andrew. First thing, the Bible says after he came to Jesus, he first found this what? Own brother, Simon. That's Peter. And he brought him to Jesus. Nathaniel brought uh, Philip to Jesus. All right? Right after he met Jesus. The Samaritan woman, no sooner she had met this man, somebody different than she'd ever met before, and knew things about her past and her present nobody else knew. They were secrets as far as she thought. But Jesus started unfolding for her, her very personal, personal, every detail of her life. And in so doing, that woman knew, hey, this man is not just a man. This is the one they talk about. This is the one I've heard about. This must be the miracle worker. But I think she meant more than that, to uh, re realize more than that. This is the one we've been looking for. Mm -hmm. And I believe she got saved. The reason I say that, because later in the chapter, it says she went back and she started witnessing to the whole city. And the Bible doesn't say she witnessed the whole city. It says particularly, specifically, she witnessed to the men in the city, and the men in the city believed on him because of the saying of the woman. Man, she didn't even take the soul winning course, but yes, she was, she, man, she was already ready to go to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Yeah. How much do you really pray for people to come and be saved and come to Jesus Christ? Oh, how we ought to have a desire. Amen? Mm -hmm. Hey, if I got uh, Jr. back there to reach, I'm not going to do that because you got your camera in front of you. But if I was to get Jr., I'll tell you what, I'll do that. Gene, you're back there closest to the light switch. Cut the light off. Now, I know we're on camera. I know that. By the way, welcome to those who are watching live or by Internet. Now, cut it back on. All right, let me ask everybody here. How quickly did the light come on? Almost as quick as it was cut on, wasn't it? Back off. All right, that cut on pretty quick. I'm sorry to scare a bunch of you men out there because you don't like the dark. I can see some of you biting your nails and all the shaking. But anyway, now we know a few of you men's phobia, phobia. But anyway, I'm only joking. But what am I saying? I'm saying, hey, that light switch, the minute it cut on, we had light again. With a matter of seconds, milliseconds, actually. So I'm simply saying, hey, how soon should we start witnessing when we get saved? Immediately. And that's what God, I think, is saying in this gate, being positioned right beside the sheep gate, the gate of sacrifice, the gate where all the lambs in. Then let me let me touch on the third one. I've got about uh, ten minutes, no, five minutes, seven minutes. Okay, according to that watch right there. I'm going by the clock on up there, John. Okay, I got about five minutes. I think according to that, I think I can finish this for about five. Look at look at verse six. There's another one that is mentioned in verse six. More of the what's the name of this gate? The old gate repaired. Now, what in the world is he talking about? The old gate. Now, notice I didn't say old goat. <laughs> okay I started to debate which one's the oldest goat Warren or Shirley's husband Dennis huh what did you say hey hey <laughs> he didn't say old goat but he said old gate now that's the reason why by the way something interesting in history I found out this gate is the only gate that has never, never been changed. 
In other words, it was broken down, but they replaced it and repaired it right specifically the same place it originally was. All right? Some of the other gates weren't exactly specifically placed. But I believe they were placed by God. Don't misunderstand me. But this is a gate that's just been just steadfast, just faithful, just always by the stuff, so to speak. And, uh, but it's called the old gate. Can I tell you, here's what I think you ought to write down for the old gate. You ought to write down beside the old gate, standards. Or you can write down the word, both of them works, the word scriptures. Now, we're going to look at the scriptures a little bit later because there is a gate specifically for that called the water gate. We're going to tell you why when we get to that gate. But this one has to do with the old standards. Right beside even that Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah cries out to the people of God and he basically says we need to return as a nation, listen to this, to the old paths. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you what's missing in a lot of churches today? What's missing in a lot of Christians today is people still wanting to uh, uh, grip and get a good grip and a good hold on the old paths. I'm not talking about no change. Don't misunderstand me. There's a difference. All right? I think there's always, no no church ought to change its message. Amen. But there's nothing wrong with sometimes as long as we can, we can uh, justify it and even have scriptural ground why we can't change our methods mm -hmm. by reaching people by that I simply mean. Add some new tools. Add some new opportunities. Hey, I expect in Jesus' day, they didn't know what a bus was. That's right. But the bus ministry was touched of God in the 60s and actually started in the 50s under Lee Robinson. Uh, as far as I know, that's the oldest bus ministry in America, as far as I, 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 rec I, I have recorded. And that was in the 50s. He started the first one, and then it started spreading like a prairie fire. And do you realize the tens of thousands that's been in the ministry because of a bus route? And because they got saved? Because somebody knocked at a, at a door on a Saturday to invite them? Hey, but buses were not. They were new. New methodology, new methodology but the same old message. Everybody with me? So, man, we need to, to, get, to stick with the old stuff. Two things about today that, it, that can be dangerous if not careful. Number one, today's generation loves, and I don't mean a particular age bracket. I'm talking about America as a whole. We'll just use America because I live in America. But we love things that are always new. We're the throwaway generation. Man, I, I go to the dump, and I'm, I stand appalled at the things at the dump. My daddy would have, would have had a field day in our day. He would have come back with a truck more loaded down than what he took to the dump. Because he'd see things he could repair. He'd see things he could fix. Man, we don't, we don't have fixing shops anymore. You get a washing machine, don't work. You just throw it out and go buy another one. I mean, that's good for everything. I'm still waiting for the day we get to do that with our wives. Amen? Husbands, amen. See, I preach like this night, and I ain't sleeping at home. Watch her be tuned in to the internet tonight. Oh, she is watching. Honey, I really love you. I want you to love you. <laughs> but anyhow, hey, I'm simply saying that, man, we have, we have, we're noted to throw things away. Nothing's fixed anymore. We don't like to hold to the old. Are you with me? Hey, anybody, anybody here love or like antiques? Anybody here? No. You like antiques, Sean? <laughs> That's because you're married to one, Shirley. <laughs> no wonder. You, you can't tell us you love them. You married one. You married an antique. But anyway, I'm simply saying, man, we need to treasure the old. Now, don't, don't, don't think I don't think we ought to change some things. All right? I'm saying there's some things that ought not to change. The, the generation likes things that are new. And then, boy, not only do they like things that are new, but they also like this is a day when they like things always changing. I had someone just this week tell me, you know what, I've been going to this church for a long time. I think I'm just going to change. No reasoning. I'm just looking for something new and looking for a change. Now, I can see if she's saying, hey, I want to go where somebody's being saved or where a church is growing or where there's fire or where there's life or where there's, you know, something scriptural or whatever. Are you with me? I understand that. But just to say, say just go, well, I'm just tired. I'm, just, I'm tired of the mundane. I want to go try something new. That could be dangerous. Are you with me? Yeah. But people like change. Well, can I tell you what? Let me give you some things that are the old past. God doesn't change. The Bible right. says. God's the God who changes what? Not. God never changes. Can I tell you what? 
the Word of God never changes. That's right. It doesn't cater, it doesn't bow, it doesn't bend to any of our whims or any of our, our beliefs or what we want to put into the test to. God still says, thus saith the Lord, and thus is right, thus is wrong, this is black, this is white. There's no in-between. The Word of God spells it simplistically and puts it just where the rubber meets the road, over and over again. So the Word of God doesn't change. And then let me quickly say, hey, not only the Word of God doesn't change, God doesn't change. Aren't you going to think God's salvation doesn't change? Mm -hmm. Man, the whole house, we had a house filled Sunday night down there. And after all these men started coming down, some in tears, some men just rejoicing. Man, many of them, um, man, we had probably 40 men, 40 men brand new to our services Sunday night. Many of them got saved coming to the, down for the first time. But can I say this? At the end of the service, I shouted out and I said, Men, aren't you glad? Thank God Jesus still saves and see Jesus still changes life. That whole house went an uproar. And they all shouted, Amen, yay! And they started clapping and going crazy. Why? Because, man, thank God salvation doesn't change. It's still through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's still through the, by the grace of God. It's still through faith alone, by the grace alone, through Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Thank God salvation doesn't change. And no matter man today may want to try to change it, man may want to recommend some new uh, religion, some new way, some new thing, but listen, all that is new isn't always true. That's right. Are you with me? All that is new is not always true necessarily true. Can I tell you one? Some other things don't change either. Sin doesn't change. It's always been a minus. It's always been a blemish. It's always subtracted. It has never added one thing to anybody ever. Amen? Amen. Sin doesn't change. So thank God there's some old paths we need to cling to. Some old paths we need to we need to continue. I want you to know, lady, I'm preaching right now. You shut up. <laughs> 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 Amen. You thought it was turned off. It must not be. I didn't even try. I, I may hit mine on tonight inside. I'm not sure. But anyway, no different. I'm just about done anyway. You couldn't have hit it more at possible time. I'm two minutes over what I said I was going to do. I, I want you to notice one last thing, though, on this, this particular, the rebuilding of this particular wall. Look at verse 8. Who participated? The Bible says, and the goldsmiths repaired and rebuilt. Do you see that? The goldsmiths? Mm -hmm. Goldsmiths were people that worked with delicate, literally and intricate, more detailed things. And yet now you're seeing, and God put this here for a reason, now you're seeing the goldsmiths putting <coughs> huge stones. Putting in huge stones. Doing more manual labor. Can I tell you why God, I think, put that in there? God is saying, hey, no matter what you do, no matter where you came from, what your talents, what your gifts, if you do something in my name, I take notice. Doesn't name the goldsmith, just simply gives them a, a reference to say, hey, the goldsmith. But then also, if you would, look down at uh, verse 8b and then verse 12. He talks about the apothecaries are involved in the rebuilding of this wall. The apothecaries is where we get the word drugstore from or pharmacy. It would be peel poppers or peel rollers, okay? And that's what we would call them in our day. But man, even they were involved in this particular work. Also, apothecaries in this particular time meant not only possibly the peel part of it or the drugstore part, but it also means perfumers to make things smell better. So man, he's just simply recognizing different ones, different groups and saying, hey, I want you to know, people of God, when you do something in my name, when you're doing something in my will, when you're doing my way and my work, I want you to notice, I notice and I recognize what you do. So, man, that means anything we do for Jesus, for Jesus, his sake, his glory, God says, hey, I saw that. I saw that. Aren't you glad? <laughs> so, man, that just tells us all we just need to stay busy and try to serve and try to do what we can, while we can, as long as we can, for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I will. Amen, church? Amen. 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 All right. You cut the, the field?